Our next presenter is uh, Emily Burns. Uh, Emily is the uh, science director at Save the Redwoods League. She's uh, a native Northern, Northern Californian, um, uh, graduated from UC Davis in plant biology and a PhD in Berkeley. She's worked on redwood forests uh, for a long time. Her PhD work was on that as well as a postdoc at UC Santa Cruz. And uh, I got to meet Emily just before the last Redwood Symposium. She came on board as the science director, and uh, she's doing a terrific job uh, organizing the science programs that saved the Redwoods League. So she'll provide us with a broad overview of uh, some of the science issues uh, facing uh, Redwoods, and uh, I'll turn it right over to her. So, Emily. Excellent. So this is going to be my version of a brief history of time. Um, I shortened my title partly because I realized when I delved into the details of the history of redwood science, a hundred years doesn't cover it. And I have to start with this quote. I found this as I was surveying the literature. And I don't know whether Mr. Grant, the predecessor of mine at Save the Redwoods League, was having a vision of what my office was going to look like 80 years later. Maybe. But it's just pretty fascinating to me in the 30s, there was an awareness that there was so much Redwood literature. And where did we find, how could people find it all? And so this was at the beginning of an annotated bibliography from the 30s. Now I think the invention of the internet has helped in many ways. But there's also been a lot more science since then. So what I think is going to be kind of fun about my talk is that by the time the afternoon sessions begin, my talk is going to be way out of date. And I'm sure many of you will come up to me and tell me major things that I missed and I didn't include. And I look forward to that. So I'm going to begin with talking about a few themes that emerged as I was going over the history of Redwood science. Some things that really stuck out, and not because of just the discoveries that were made, because of what it told, tells us about the pace and the pattern of how Redwood research has progressed. I'm not going to cover all topics within the realm of Redwood research. I'm going to be focusing on a few that I know well, and ones that have illustrated the history of the science, and really cue us up to what's coming next. So we're going to go way back. We're going to go back to 1769 to kick this off. And this is the first European mention of Redwood. During the Portola expedition, the Franciscan monk, Fray Juan Crespi, wrote in his diaries as the expedition was near the Monterey Bay. We think they were around Soquel Creek in the Santa Cruz Mountains, and writing about these massive forested areas with trees that were not recognizable. And they called them Redwood. I don't think I could have come up with a better name. So that was 19, uh, sorry, 1769, and it took a few more decades until the first known collections of redwoods happened. And we give Archibald Menzies the credit for bringing the collections back to England that ultimately led to the formal botanical, botanical descriptions of the species. So this was happening, his collection happened during the Vancouver expedition in 1795. So the collections went back to Europe and then decades passed. So if you're starting to realize we're starting with a slow pace, beginning the observations of redwoods, some collection. And it wasn't, it wasn't until 1824 that the first naming of redwood in the traditional Latin way, the name was given. Elmer Burke Lambert gave the name Taxodium sempervirens. Taxodium out of recognition of the similarities between redwood and bald cypress. Sequoia sempervirens became the name in 1847. And Stephen Enlicker gave this name recognizing that the coast redwood was actually unique and stood alone in its genus. There's been a lot of interesting dialogue around where the name Sequoia came from, and there is no definitive explanation of where. Perhaps after the Cherokee scholar, Sequoia, it could also, there's reference that it could be because of the sequence of redwood fossils in the record, and it's derived from the word sequence. We don't know. That mystery stands. 
All of this understanding about the evolutionary relationships of coast redwood to other redwoods over geologic time came from the exploration of the morphology of the species. And botanists, and I'm going to skip over a lot of taxonomic history here, but through the 19th century and into the beginning of the 20th century, botanists were cutting and slicing and dicing the conifer lineage a bunch of different ways. They were analyzing the morphological traits and lumping species together and then splitting them. And sequoia danced around through the different families that changed over time until 1926 when finally the traditional conifer families, many that we still recognize today, were defined, and redwood was stuck in Taxodiaceae. So there it stayed for 50 years, until in the 70s it was proposed that actually the Taxodiaceae seemed to be morphologically nested within the Cupressaceae. There were a series of studies that corroborated that on different bases of morphological investigation, and then 1994, genetic markers come on the scene, and there is verification that yes, in fact, we have a monophyletic clade when we pull Taxodiaceae species into the Cupressaceae. So now, that's where it is. The genetic markers, and I want to talk a little bit more about that, have taught us so much about what we know about Sequoia sempervirens, its rela evolutionary relationships to other species, and here in this figure from Yarmula Pitterman et al. from 2012, you can look at the evolutionary relationships along deep time and where the species diverge. This study is actually about the physiology and the physiological differences between the species, but this sort of research was made possible with that verification of the genetic markers and that phylogenetic relationship. So genetic markers, Especially, most of the work so far has been done on neutral genetic markers, such as allozymes or microsatellites. And we've learned some really interesting things, and this has been a proliferation of studies that have followed the first integration of genetic tools. We learned that redwood's, redwood is pretty interesting in that there's paternal inheritance of chloroplasts and mitochondria. And in 1989, when this paper came out and showed that, it was the first species, and maybe only still, I don't know, <laughs> you can correct me, the first species to have evidence of that paternal inheritance of mitochondria. So just another example of just sort of odd things about Sequoia sempervirens. There's also been a series of really interesting studies about clonal diversity, clonal richness within a stand, how many different clones exist, the distance between ramets, up to 40 meters or even more within a single grove. Why is that? What's happening? What, what, what's going on? Um, we're also seeing that clonality within the, the traditional fairy ring. Occasionally we're seeing you know, up to 10 or 11 percent of individuals within a fairy ring are actually not clones to the trees they're attached to. Lakshmi Narayan, um, recent graduate from Cal, has shown that 11% of the time when trees are fused at the base, they are not genetically identical. <laughs> and a third theme that's come out of these gen genetic marker studies, which I find pretty fascinating, is there is a genetic dis distinction and disjunction between the northern populations and the southern populations, which certainly could have huge ramifications for the conservation of these species. Now, what do we, where do we go from here with the genetics? Well, this is all very recent on that timeline, the, the new genetic marker tools. And yet, we have really compelling questions about what genetic diversity is out on the landscape. Every time we're making management decisions on the land, we're affecting the genetic diversity on the landscape and the raw material that will be there for selection in the future. Save the Redwoods League has decided to sequence the redwood genome. And next year, we'll have the first sequences available. And in three years, we're hoping to have the genetic tools available for all of us to be able to go out and to screen stands like this, to know which of these young individuals may have the rare genotypes that we need to protect, which ones are going to grow the most quickly, sequester the most carbon, which ones are going to grow that straight grain timber that everybody wants. So I think this is really exciting and represents the next stage of where we can go with these interesting genetic tools. Going back to our timeline, at the same time that genetic 
tools were coming into the Redwood research scene, we had the first ascension into the Sequoia Sempervirens canopy. Now this is a maybe relatively minor uh, methodological innovation, innovation, but it's led to a proliferation of studies. At the last symposium, Steve Sillett talked about his research in the canopy, canopy and I'm just going to review that briefly and then mention some of the new stuff that's followed on the heels of that first research. It's pretty hard to study an organism that you can't even see the top of. And by going up into the canopy, the first motivation was really to understand what lives up there. What critters are crawling around, what birds are landing, and what different types of plants are assembling in these trees' crowns. And what Steve Sillett and his colleagues found were pretty amazing. One of the most common species found is Polysticum, sorry, that's my fern that I study, <laughs> Polypodium schooleri, the leatherleaf fern. Fascinating species that grows succulent rhizomes and fibrous roots in huge mats draping over redwood limbs. They collect fog, rainfall, leaf litter, and help with the accumulation and development of canopy soils. They also provide great habitat for another common species in the canopy, Vaccinium ovatum. This species feeds birds up in the canopy and loves to root in the connections between branches and trunks, reiterated trunks. The research has shown every time uh, biologists go into the canopy, they're finding different species growing, clinging to every surface imaginable. And if you're really lucky on a good day, you might see the wandering salamander who loves to crawl around through those species. Uh, let all the plants and crawl into the bark and actually into dead heartwood in old forests. So the canopy biology that began was all around biodiversity and we've really only touched the surface of this. We're learning about the fungi and bacteria that are growing on and in leaves of redwood trees. What influence are they having on the growth, growth and function of these trees? Are young forests different from old forests? What about forests of different, different climate? There's so much to do. But one of the prof profound things that we found about studying the can life in the canopy was that the structure of the trees, the host trees, was very fascinating. If we look at this figure, this is from Sillet and Van Pelt from 2007. You see the height of the redwood tree on, on the y-axis. On the x-axis, you're seeing three different series of things. The left panel describes the canopy structures. And one thing I just want to point out, as you move up a tree with height, look at the blue bands, trunks rising from other trunks, this complex structure that develops in large old trees. So that is interesting because it provides an amazing amount of habitat, and the middle panel is showing the distribution of the two most common epiphytes, Vaccinium ovatum and Polypodium schooleri. Look how high they're growing up in these trees, up to 90 meters in many cases. And on the right-hand side, you're seeing what else is developing because of this complex crown structure. Incredibly deep soils that host a huge richness of arthropods, and then you're also seeing water storage, all, all up there in the crown. Vo huge volumes, cubic meters of water being stored in the soils and the plants that are growing on top of the redwoods. But it's the structure, and it's the structure of the host that really captivated many of the biologists that were working up there in the canopy. So the attention shifted pretty quickly from thinking just about the biodiversity and thinking about the host trees themselves. In 1929, Emmanuel Fritz wrote a paper trying to myth bust a lot of the rumors about redwoods, but he perpetuated one in his paper he wrote that year. He said that old trees, their productivity declines with age. And that stuck. That stuck, and a lot of people felt that that must be true. And I'm sure I, if I didn't have the benefit of reading the literature, I would think the world is flat. And if you look at the tree ring record from an old, tr old tree, yeah, really thin, small tree rings in old trees. But Steve Sillett and his colleagues showed something pretty profound in 2010. Showed that the increase in wood production goes up with age. And it's not because the trees are older, it really has to do with the fact that they're larger. They have more leaves for doing photosynthesis, they have more cambium for growing, and that surface area results in many kilograms of wood being produced 
And so on the graph on the right, it's comparing Sequoia sempervirens to the second tallest tree species, Eucalyptus regnans. And the top panel shows that wood growth, that annual wood growth in kilograms for trees of different ages, starting down there with almost, you know, just a teenager redwood all the way up to nearly 2,000 years old. And these trees do not level off. So that was pretty fascinating. If we take this one step further and think about the accumulation of woody biomass and retention in the forest over time, our old forests are unequivocally holding more biomass above ground than any other forest in the world. Robert Van Felt's new paper that came out this year documents how much more carbon is being stored in our coast redwood forests that haven't been harvested than any other forest in the world. And not only is it a lot of, lot of biomass, it's the bio kind of biomass that stays around for a really long time. It's that decay-resistant heartwood. And you can see that in the large bars with the red color on this graph. So this all started with looking more closely at the forest, looking at the structure of the host trees for epiphytes, and then looking at the growth rates of the redwoods themselves. I was in a meeting yesterday with the director of the Cal Academy of Sciences. I was talking about our collaboration with Allison Carroll at Humboldt State and the use of dendrochronology. And I told him it's one of the major methodological innovations that's changing the way we're thinking about redwoods. And he looked at me and said, that's a really old technology. And I said, nothing better yet. <laughs> there really isn't. Um, by pairing the growth of the, these trees, by going up into the crown and measuring the volume of these trees and pairing that with the series of tree cores going at the height of the tree, what we've been able to do is grow these trees backwards in time and look at their wood production over the history of each tree's life. When that happens, we found something pretty phenomenal. This is from Steve Sillett and colleagues' paper from 2015 that shows trends in wood production for both sequoia on the left-hand side and sequoia dendron on the right-hand side. The upper panels are, are, are showing you the growth trends from 1751 to 1850. And on the bottom panel, we're looking at the recent century of growth. These growth trends have taken into account the size of the tree, and they're independent from tree size. So the p pattern isn't the trees are growing more just because they're larger. It's been detrended. What you see in the 1700s is that some trees were doing well. You see a blue positive fit line over the wood accumulation over time. The red trends going down, some trees, their wood production was declining, and if it's black, it's neutral. The most recent century, we're seeing unprecedented growth rates in trees of all ages. Towards the left-hand side of the panels, you're seeing younger trees, and along the x-axis, older and older trees. And that trend is continuing. It's even happening with the sister redwoods in the Sierra. That was pretty interesting to find that out. So then everybody's next question is, well, why? <laughs> why are the redwoods growing faster than they have? What's going on? Now, from measuring the wood cores and measuring the volume of these trees throughout the range, we can document that growth. We cannot say what the driving factors are with any confidence, but we are beginning to speculate. And one of the interesting factors that's been implicated is the reduction in fog. In recent years, a paper came out documenting the reduction in fog over the 20th century, which was pretty concerning for a lot of us, including myself, who started out doing research studying the benefits of fog to redwood forest flora. So I'm going to just briefly pop back in time just to review what we've learned about fog. For the second half of the 20th century, most of the research on fog, and it was very spread out through time, was simply looking at interception of fog in the redwood forest from the ground, looking at where fog was coming in, measuring how much was coming in, and being looking at how much that volume of water could actually contribute to the annual water budget of redwood forest plants. It was in 2004 that the discovery was made that redwood trees were actually absorbing that fog water directly into the crown. And Steve Burgess and Todd Dawson 
plugged sap flow sensors into redwood trees, and showed that on foggy nights, sap flow was reversing. Water was going down. And the only way that that was going to happen is if water was coming in through the top. And this discovery of foliar uptake was another one of those discoveries that led to proliferation of research. There are a series of studies on how fog improves the water status of redwood trees and other plants, even documenting a huge decoupling between hydration at the top of a redwood tree from the soil. If enough fog exposure was coming in, those plants could be fully hydrated, even if the soil was dry. Also, this fog research began to look at ecological <clears throat> cycles with nitrogen and the role that fog plays in bringing nitrogen into the forest. So you look at all that literature and it sure seems like fog is good for the forest. So what is going on? What's going on is we still have enough water in the redwood forest. We're still getting enough rain. The redwood trees are enjoying the sunny days, more access to light that they need to do photosynthesis. And at this point in time, redwood growth rates continue to increase. What, the reason why I illustrate this example, not only because it blew my mind over the last few years, and I've been struggling with trying to understand it, but it, it describes to me how much we need to be integrating across disciplines. I work a lot with physiologists, and if you study one particular aspect of physiology, it all makes sense. But these redwoods are, are growing in incredibly complex environments, and the environments are changing. So my, my, my point here is that we're going to have to continue to study every aspect of climate, every aspect of how these trees respond, and, and tr continually work together to pull, pull that information together. What's going to happen with fog in the future? What are the physiological thresholds of redwoods that they can actually handle as climate continues to change? These are completely open questions. But we've been able to get to where we are today because of these major innovations spanning from genetics into accessing the canopy and using dendrochronology and other physiological tools. So I want to review what we've talked about so far and then talk to you about a few future directions. So here's a very, very brief history, even getting more brief as I go. Um, but just to put it in context of how we were off to a slow start. 250 years of redwood research. The first, more than the first half was spent almost exclusively on taxonomy and it was a confusing time for botanists. As we get to the ends of the, uh, the 20th century and into our current century, we're seeing a huge influx in different kinds of tools. Now I realize that this picture is incomplete. There's a lot of redwood science that I have not described. But even on the themes that I have talked about in topics, I have to wonder what I've missed. And I wonder what unpublished data is out there. Now I bring this up because I am guilty of it as well. <laughs> I have several papers that have been sitting um, in the back of my mind haunting me that I know I need to make the time to publish. And if you feel like it, please raise your hand if you're in the same boat. Do you have papers that you wish you had time to publish? Well, that, that's not so bad, actually. <laughs> if you're being honest, and it's only a handful of you. I say this because we are a relatively small community, and I hope that you will come and speak with me if you have an obstacle to getting data published. One of the best things that we can do is put our data out there into the public sphere. If you need to work with a statistician, if you need a little bit of extra funding to bring that experiment to closure, if you need to go and sit in a writing retreat with other people who are struggling with writing, let's go do it. Let's figure out how to make sure that we don't let another cycle of symposia go by without getting that, that data out into the public sphere. I also want to talk about a theme that, that Jana mentioned, and this has to do with who we are who we are, the Redwood Research Community. And this is just one slice looking at the contributors to the Coast Redwood Science Symposium over time. There was a big year in 2004, a lot of participation, and that actually had the highest percentage of female presenters. Here we are in 2016. It looks pretty similar to the last one. We have 22% um, female presentations. But this is a little bit misleading, and I'm going to 
change that number. And that's because there are a few females here who are doing, giving multiple talks. So Lucy, Erin, you know who you are. <laughs> Thank you. I wanted to mention this, not, not to um, berate all of us, but just to recognize that there is, we are behind um, forestry and conservation in general in the United States. The trend is about 32% female working in forestry and conservation. And in the Coast Redwood Range, if we think that the symposia is reflective of females working on redwood science, we're on the lower end of that. The national trend for females with PhDs working in this sector is about 25%. I don't think it would be very hard for us to at least beat that. So, you know, grab a friend, let's stick together, let's figure out how to crack this net. So what's next? <clears throat> I've listed a few things here about where I think our investment, both public and private investment, needs to go in the coming years when it comes to redwood research. We need to understand the genetic adaptations to how redwood is going to respond to a continually changing environment. And that's why one of our first investments is going to be in sequencing the redwood genome. We need to understand biodiversity. We're really not going to be able to conserve and manage all of the organisms that are interdependent in the Coast Redwood Range if we don't know who they are, we don't know where they are. So this is real basic re research that needs to happen. And that's from underground all the way up to the treetop. We need to continue to invest in understanding the cycles of fire and carbon and nutrients. These are things that we, there are a lot of good studies that are putting those pieces together for us. And we can't walk away from those ecological processes. We need to understand them so that we can restore them back to the landscape. And my first point here is we need to publish in open access journals. Working in a nonprofit and working with many agency partners that don't have access to the literature, it is, it's no longer okay for us to be publishing in exclusive journals that the public doesn't have, have access to. And I hope from this moment on we can really think about where we send our data, how we're communicating it, how we're sharing it with one another. And for those of you who have tenure, for those of you where the specific journal that you publish in doesn't affect your progression with your career, I do hope that you'll make them the choice to choose an open access journal. This symposium helps so much with the publication of the proceedings and I'm so grateful um, for the symposium organizers to making sure that happens. So lastly, if you're interested in working on these topics, if you have inspiration that strikes you at the symposium over the next few days, you have an opportunity to get funding. So if you're not aware, Save the Redwoods League has a research grants program, and we're holding open our call for pre-proposals until next week, until the 27th. Real simple, two-page proposal, send us your idea, and we'll, if we think it's a good fit for our program, we'll invite full proposals in October. So this is a great opportunity, especially for graduate students, to get funding, to get your research started. Um, again, if you've got projects, old projects, that you just need to close out and finish, publish them, let me know. Thank you. Are there any questions? We've got time for one. Yeah, this uh, ability of the redwood to take water out of the fog and uh, apparently put it back into the ground. Do we know what temperature that that stops at? What lower temperature? Does it continue below, say, 35 degrees or 30? Since a lot of these uh, events do depend on temperature. And the reason I ask, uh, I'm from northwestern Oregon, Mm -hmm. And up there on our property, our Douglas fir is dying. We have coast redwood that, that is doing great. I'm wondering, uh, last, not this last winter, but the winter before last, did the, the fog that we get quite a bit of uh, basically recharge the aquifer to some degree for the redwoods, whereas the Douglas fir didn't have that capability? Is that why they're dying? Do we, do we know much about this? <laughs> Well, I think we know that redwoods are super trees. Um, but the recharge 
to the aquifer, I've been asked that a lot. Um, small landowners and communities that are concerned about wells are very interested to know what redwoods are doing. They're such a shallowly rooted species um, that it, they are un unlikely tapped down into to deep water. And so is there a conduit for them to be moving water? Hydraulic redistribution has been shown in many species. With redwood, I think the like, most likely scenario is that redwoods are using less of their soil water when they have access to canopy water. So when you have condon, uh, the coalescing of fog water droplets on redwoods, it's like putting a lid on a glass of water. They're able to be more conservative with the water resources they have. They are transpiring less, and then they're actually absorbing some of it. As to the cold aspect, as long as there's liquid water available, there should be the mechanism for the water to get into the leaves. There's some conjecture for other species, especially up in Alaska and places that freeze, that the first water that the that trees are taking in is happening with water on leaf surfaces. So fully rust take is not unique to coast redwood, and it might be that early spring hydration when maybe the soil and the roots are still frozen. Um, that first liquid water may be available up there. After freezing the cuticle cracks, there's a lot of pathways for, for water to get in. Last question. Yeah, I was wondering about that, the plot about the increased growth in the redwoods since the, what was it, the 18th century, 19th century? And in particular, I was wondering if there was a difference between redwoods at the southern end of the range and at the northern end of the range. Yeah, interesting. Well, <clears throat> the surge, the most recent surge has happened since the 1970s. That's when the growth, in the growth record, we're seeing that to be, to be the highest. We have seen that growth increase throughout the redwood range, but it's definitely strongest up in the northern part of the state. Humboldt and, and Del Norte counties have, have had the most unprecedented growth. Well, with that, we'll uh, take, thank you very much, Emily.